And so question number two. Here we have a magnified image of a dark central disk surrounded by concentric dark rings. These are due to something called the interference of monochromatic light. So they're rings due to an effect that you'll come across actually later on in grade 11. Okay, but you don't really need to understand the idea of it um, to understand the data because it's always the same questions. The graph shows how the ring diameter D varies with a ring number. Okay, so as we go from 1, 2, 3, 4, that would be our ring number. Um, and the diameter D would be the size. Okay. If we then look at the graph, it follows this pattern. And we have some error bars. Okay. And let's have a look at the axes. We have D in centimeters on the y-axis and N on the x-axis. Now we'll probably come back to this graph in a minute. But let's have a, have a look at what the question says. So let's have a look here at the possibilities in terms of a line of best fit. The line of best fit going through every point, even if it's just touching the error bars, is pretty much impossible. So even if we try and stretch it from this furthermost point and try and construct a straight line, there isn't one. So it must be a curve. So you have to draw a curve that goes through as many points as possible. Okay, so this is a rough outline. Um, it's very difficult to draw with this application, but I think I've done okay. Um, now, luckily, the mark scheme actually states to ignore uh, the extrapolation. So whether you've done it from origin or you've tried to create an intercept, it doesn't matter. Okay, the examiner is only interested in whether you go close to each point and that you are within the error bars. Now what I'm going to do is um, just outline a very important point which is relevant to the next question. Um, at n equals 7, if we have a look on this graph, we will need to read off, read off this value here which is approximately 1.26, that's D. And we also need to identify the size of the error bars. Now what we've got here are approximately two small squares. So if we look at the um, scale, then that would be equal to 0.26. Not eight centimeters. Okay, so the uncertainty in D is 0 0.08 when n is equal to seven. So that information will be useful later. Question A: Familiar territory. State one piece of evidence that D is not proportional to n. And the answer would be that it does not go through the origin and it is not a straight line. And according to the mark scheme, both of these are okay answers. Okay, part B, which we've already done. On the graph opposite, draw the line of best fit for the data points. And part C, we're going to ignore, okay, because it involves an analysis using logarithms which we'll play with next year. Okay, so you can ignore this part of the question. Okay, let's go on to the next section. Okay, so here we've got a new theory. We've got a theory that states that maybe uh, P is a half, and so D squared equals Kn. So what does that tell us? It tells us that D squared is proportional to N. And so therefore, if we plot D squared, against n, we should get a straight line through the origin, and it looks like we do. If we like follow that on, it seems to go through the origin. But that's not what they're asking. Let's have a look. Using the graph on page 2, the previous graph, calculate the percentage uncertainty in D 
Now we've already got some of this information because on the previous graph, we when n was equal to 7, we found that d was equal to 1.26 and there was an uncertainty value of plus or minus 0 0.08. Now this comes in really handy because from here we can work out the percentage uncertainty in D which would be equal to 0 0.08 divided by 1.26 Okay, which gives us approximately 6.3%. Now that would be the percentage uncertainty in D. The percentage uncertainty in D squared, because it's a power of 2, would just be 2 times 6.3, which we round up in the end to about 13%. So that's the answer, that's our percentage uncertainty. And then we've got the same question again. Based on the graph opposite, state one piece of evidence that supports the relationship is indeed proportional. So it's asking you again, what is a proportion a proportional graph? What does a proportional graph look like? And the ideal answer to that, it would pass through the origin, and the line would be straight within all the error bars. There we go. Now, in the graph opposite, and I'm going to have to do this here as an explanation rather than on the actual graph, you would de determine the value of the constant k. Now, the constant of proportionality would be equal to the gradient if we linearize this here d squared equals k n. So we can see if n is on the x-axis, d squared is on the y-axis, then k is equal to our gradient. Okay, so show your read-offs on your graph. Actually label your read-offs in the graph and actually write them in this section so the examiner can see your thinking clearly, okay? So I would have something like 1.2 on the rise, which is on the y-axis, and a 5 on the run. So in the end, I got a gradient of approximately 0 0.24 centimetres squared. Okay, so really, really important that here you write 1.2 over 5. So, and you actually include, I'm going to do this properly, you include all read-offs. So you say 1.2 minus 0, 5 minus 0, because otherwise it looks like you're just plotting coordinates, and the examiner needs to see that you're actually doing the full range. Another very important point is use a gradient size which is more than half the whole line. Make it a large triangle. I'm not going to go into too much detail about how to do the next bit. You guys can do this because you have the graphs in front of you. But you also need to work out the uncertainty of the graph. And that's why this question is worth four marks. So by joining the top error bar of the maximum point to the bottom error bar you will have your maximum gradient, and you have to do the same thing. You have to show your read-offs and your calculations, and then you would do exactly the same thing, but this time with the minimum. So you, you take the minimum point from the uh, uncertainty and the error bars, and you would join it to the top of the minimum value, and you would draw a straight line like that coming a bit of a mess now and that would be your minimum okay so in the end you end up with you end up with three gradients the actual value I should actual value the maximum gradient and the minimum gradient 
And there's two ways that you can use that to your uncertainty. So my values were 0 0.24 for the main one, which is the red line. And then I had 0 0.26 for my maximum and 0 0.19. Now, there are two ways of working out the uncertainty. You can either use the maximum deviation, which would be 0 0.05, or there's a method that the IB seems to favour, which would be to, to actually just work out the difference between the maximum and the minimum. This is your minimum. And this is your maximum. So if you calculate the difference, then you would end up with 0.26 minus 0.19, which will give you a difference of 0.07. Right? So what you would do to work out the uncertainty is just divide it by 2, which gives you 0.035. And you'd round that up to 0. 0.4. Okay, it's a little bit different to what you've been using in the investigations, and both are valid for the investigations, but it seems to be from the mark scheme that the IB prefers this method. Last question state the unit for the constant k, and that is simply the unit on the y axis, which is centimeters squared, divided by the unit on the x axis. And there's no unit. So the constant k has a unit of centimetres squared.